Hey everybody, it's Dr. Z. Okay, my friend Dr. Peter Atia just recently wrote an amazing piece that I'm gonna link to in the comments. I'm gonna summarize it for you here. What is the most important test we need to do right now to figure out whether A, we can reopen parts of the economy thoughtfully and carefully, or B, we need to keep a very serious lockdown until we have better treatments, a vaccine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what it is. To begin, we have to back up and go, remember those models that we were listening to in the early days where they were saying somewhere between 200,000 and 2 million Americans were going to die if we did nothing? Well, all of those models use inputs of data that are imperfect and didn't incorporate levels of uncertainty that we know we have. For example, how infectious is the virus. What's the so-called R naught, R with a little zero? What that means is for every person that's infected, how many people will they infect on average? And that varies depending on situations. Do you have a lockdown? Do you have people going to bars and cafes? That Are you on a cruise ship? And the estimates for the R naught for COVID-19 were somewhere between 2.3 and 3. So that leads to models that show huge amounts of infection. But a change in 0.3 in those inputs changes the number of infected people by like 10 million. I mean, it's like, it's crazy. So we didn't have that data very carefully pinned down. So of course there's big variation. The other thing we don't and didn't know is how fatal is it in reality? So you have estimates of like two and 3% mortality, but that's based on a case fatality rate. In other words, how many people who actually show up to medical care, get tested, and are shown to have the virus, then get hospitalized and or die? That's called the case fatality rate, CFR. But what you really want to know is, of all the people that are actually infected in the world, what's the mortality rate? That's called the infection fatality rate, or IFR. And we don't know what that is because we haven't tested asymptomatic people at scale in the community to see not only are they actively infected, but were they infected recently? And the way you do that is you test for antibodies in the blood that are created in response to the infection. Now, the tests that do that aren't perfect. There's a lot of false positives. There may be false negatives. And so those have to be improved. But without that data, we're left with an interesting problem, which is we've seen less overall destruction in the U.S. than was predicted by some of the models. Now, why is this? It could be one of two major things. It could be that A, number one, we've overestimated how fatal and damaging the virus is. We've misunderstood its biology and we've overestimated how contagious it is. In other words, we've overestimated its r naught. And so there's something about this virus that just isn't as bad as the early predict predictions. And so that's case one. But case two is the reason we're doing better is that society responded aggressively and the models didn't take into account the fact that we've done aggressive social distancing, aggressive measures, whether it's masking, whether it's uh, um, closing down everything, that have dropped the r naught and have prevented cases from spreading. Now, what's the difference between these two scenarios? Well, if the truth is mostly scenario one, where we've just overestimated how fatal it was and it's not as bad, well, that means we can probably start to carefully reopen for people that are less vulnerable. And we're not talking about older folks, people with comorbidities that are, that are more uh, um, at risk, and look geographically and go, well, in areas where it's very dense and the r naught is gonna be higher like New York, you wanna be more careful than in areas like Montana or Utah, right? But if the case is case two, where it's our social distancing and, and these aggressive measures that have worked, well then, you gotta keep those generally quite tight or else you're gonna see a resurgence in cases that is gonna dwarf the initial experience because it's just gonna blow up. The r naught is high, the fatality's high, you'll overwhelm the healthcare system, all that flattening the curve goes away. Now, how do you find out which case it is, right? <laughs> the, the best way to do that, as Peter describes in his article, is to test the population of people that have maybe never had symptoms in one of the hotspots, like say New York City. And think of it this way, if you do a broad sampling, you can't test everyone in New York, that's unfeasible, but you can do enough of a broad sampling that you could extrapolate and say, okay, 
if 5% of New Yorkers have been exposed to the virus and have gotten over it or been sick or whatever, right? You can measure that with antibodies. That means that the infection fatality rate, the, in the, the rate of people that have actually um, died relative to the rate of uh, uh, people that have had the disease, it's 2.4 or so percent. That's very fatal. That's like 25 times your flu season. And that means this is deadly serious and you better keep these measures in place until we have better treatments, better protocols, better resources in the hospitals and a vaccine. All right. But what if it's 30% of New Yorkers have been exposed and infected? That drops the infection fatality rate to something like 0.4%. That's still four times worse than what we think the IFR is for influenza, but it's a way different game. So you can start thinking, well, at 30% of the population, we're gonna start approaching what they call herd immunity or community immunity because community immunity thresholds depend on what the reproductive number of that virus is. So for measles, it's gotta be like 90% of people have to be exposed before you get community immunity. But for something like influenza, it's more like you know 40, 50%, it's lower because it's less contagious. So we, we are starting then to approach the possibility of getting herd immunity. It's not as uh, potentially fatal as we thought. And so our calculus changes. Now, do you see why it's so important that we have this information before? Because on the media now, everyone's like, we should open, we should close. Mayor Carolyn Goodman from Vegas is saying, we should open, such and such and so and so is saying close. Well, who cares what the pundits say? We need the data. Now, as Peter points out in the article, when this all started and you're seeing projections that the world is going to end based on these numbers right effectively we did the right thing which is shut everything down especially here in the bay area of california they were very aggressive early on and you can see the cases have just been stomped on right because what does that do it buys you we didn't have the data it buys you time it's like a timeout you now have the time to go and get that data rerun models or change your model and go okay what should i do next to save the most lives at the least economic cost. We had that timeout and we haven't done crap with it, <laughs> really. We need to be much more aggressive at spinning up this testing so that then we can actually change, put the inputs into the model and go, okay, let's make really educated decisions with the best data we have right now. So that's what we need to do. All this talk of like reopening, not reopening, are we wasting our time, are we not? None of it matters until we actually know what the heck we're doing. And here's the punchline of that. What is works for New York City and their numbers may not apply to Montana or Utah. It may not apply to sparse populations. And it's not gonna be the same recommendation for someone who's young with no other diseases as it is for someone who's older with comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, heart failure, those kind of things that put you at higher risk. So there isn't a one size fits all. There isn't a one community fits all, but we have to science the crap out of this, which is why we need to focus all our resources on getting that information, making sure our hospital capacity and PPE capacity is spun up so we're ready for wave two and three, and understanding this virus so we know what's the true infection fatality rate, not the case fatality rate, the infection fatality rate, and how does that relate to what we're gonna put into our model so we can decide the best thing to do. All right, if you, if you wanna read more Check out the link to Peter's work. He is an outstanding thinker and logician, and he's worked in probability, uh, working actually in, he's a physician, a scientist, but working in, in mortgage risk. So he knows this stuff, you guys. So definitely check it out. If you like what we do, please share this video. Leave a comment. Tell us what you think about this. And uh, I love you guys, all right? Stay safe, and we out. Peace.